DJ Archer wrote Dear Palladio, we have acquired some land on a suburb near Venice and would like to commission you to design a house for this site. Nicola Analvise Foscari, Venice, 1559. This hypothetical letter to Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio, 1508-1580, initiating an architect-client relationship resulting in the creation of the Villa Malcontenta, one of the great homes of all time, might well be duplicated today. Although architecture has undergone many changes since then, the model for the ideal architect is still the one defined in the Renaissance. At precisely the same moment, humanism and capitalism flowered in 15th century Italy. Humanism, promoted as the cultural concomitant of a privileged merchant class, propounded the concepts of individual creativity and genius as unique to the artist. It enabled the artist to be identified as one endowed with the capacity of making something that granted him superiority over other mortals, of understanding that resulted in works to which the artist's name should be attached. The first Renaissance treaty on architecture by Leon Battista Alberti differentiates the architect from the builder by assigning to him a particular vision that transcends purely technical skills. In Alberti's words, the building of something that seems functional and that is without doubt suited to the program and available funds is not so much the work of an architect as of an ordinary builder. But to design in advance, to formulate by good judgment that which is to be resolved and perfected in every part, that is peculiar to the genius that we seek. Alberti, a gentleman architect and amateur painter of a platonic turn of mind, fostered the notion of an artistic elite, using his intellectual clout to bring about the liberation of the artist from the guild system and to elevate him to the privileged class. His propagandizing made it possible for the architect to mingle in society and to tie his career to the interests of the merchants and princes who sought and bought his services. By using the architect as translator of the wishes of the client into the form of a private dwelling, we can transact in precisely the same manner as did the Foscari brothers. Faced with the fact that new ideas always have consequences, succeeding generations of architects have been left to invent strategies for maintaining their association with patrons. Note the number of important houses from the Renaissance to the present that bear the names of the clients. In this century, Frank Lloyd Wright, America's hero architect, quested to the adventurous client to collaborate with him in the realization of the new dwelling for the new man, who was to evolve from the fulfillment of the American dream. In a prophetic statement in A Testament, he charges the client with a mission. Modern architecture implies far more intelligent cooperation on the part of the client than ever before new rewards being so much greater in a work of art than by any good taste of the usual client. The wisdom of the human investment now lies in the home as a work of art. Correspondingly, the architect becomes more important than ever. The dwelling as a work of art is a better place in which to be alive, to live with and for and by in every sense. Therefore, why not a better investment? The interests of architect and owner are thus mutual and binding on both. Never want to underestimate his case, Frank Lloyd Wright. But it must be remembered that architecture is the one art form that, in most cases, simply does not appear in its completest state, save by demand. Assuming the existence of house dreamers and house makers, what brings them together? Often a house is the interpretation of a user's desires, in other instances the client ends up living on the architect's ideal house. Consider the possibility that when the dreamer meets the maker, even with an annotated dreams in hand, the designer, in all probability, proposes a house that has undergone a period of gestation before the knock at the door of the atelier. 
The fortuitous arrival allows the architect to fit a long-imagined house on the requirements and character of the new client. If one is willing to accept the premise that, like other arts, the act of invention in architecture need not always wait for a commission to breathe it to life, then houses for sale may be seen as using the method painters and sculptors have followed for a few centuries for the presentation of their work to the public. In doing so, Houses for Sale removes some of the mystery and perhaps some of the anxiety from the initial phase of the architect-client encounter, while retaining the potential for amazement that can come from the revelation of an original work of art. An international group of eight architects was invited to respond to a program specifying the design of a family house. The guidelines of the program were purposefully indefinite in regard to the siting of each house in order to allow the architect to decide whether he would limit his proposal to a particular terrain or provide for the adaptation of his design to a variety of site conditions. The drawings, elevations, plans and models for these proposals were first presented at the Leo Castelli Gallery in New York in October of 1980 and afterward at the James Corcoran Gallery in Los Angeles. The involvement of an art gallery in this role is novel. For the first time, buildings are made available in a way formerly limited to painting, sculpture, graphics and photography, bringing architecture into the realm of contemporary art collecting. <laughs>